Hi, and welcome to this section of the Chemistry Tutor. Uh, what we're going to do in this section of videos is begin to build upon everything that we have learned and incrementally build our skills and build our knowledge. And ultimately what we want to do is to be able to talk about chemical reactions and predicting how much of something is going to react and what kind of products we're going to get and, and things like that. The predictive nature of chemistry is really why it's useful. So that you can go into a factory, design a process to make you know 100 tons of plastic or something like that. That's where we're trying to go, but we have to start off one step at a time and kind of inch our way there. So in the last DVD course, in the last batch of videos, we really focused a whole lot on really essential things. What is an atom? What is an isotope? What is a compound? What are the different kinds of compounds, ionic and covalent, and those kinds of things? And we talked about the periodic table and how it was organized. And uh, we did a lot of things that are essential bedrock, like how to form compounds, how to name compounds, very, very essential things. But we didn't really do too much as far as chemical reactions or anything other than the general nature of the idea that you can combine these things together and form chemical reactions. Well, what we're going to do is begin that journey now. And so what we're going to do in this section is talk about molecular mass and formula mass. And what I want to do is give you a brief two-minute overview of where we're going to go from here to the next few sections. It's really important for you to see where we're going so that you know why this stuff is important. And so in this section, what we're really going to do, and in the next section, this section plus the next section, is we're going to begin to tie the periodic table uh, so that we can begin to talk about measuring the mass of our, our uh, compounds, basically. So we've already talked about the atomic mass of an element, but now we're going to begin to talk about the mass of compounds and when you start combining them together. How do you calculate the mass? So that's very, very essential. We're going to talk quite a bit about that, and there's a lot of concepts along the way that we'll, we'll get to. After we successfully do that, successfully uh, you know, uh, uh, culture our ability to look at compounds as combinations of elements and actually know what their mass is in grams, in real life grams, not atomic mass units, we're going to rapidly begin to talk about grams. Um, then we're going to talk about the chemical reaction. How do they combine together? And what is likely to form after that reaction is done, right? So we'll spend a great deal of time talking about how to predict what's going to form in the chemical reaction. And then we're going to talk quite a bit about how to calculate how much, react, how much product you're going to get at the end of your chemical reaction. So that's sort of the roadmap for the next several sections I just want you to keep in mind. In this section, we're going to start talking about molecular mass and things when we start combining them together and having an actual molecule, a compound, and how do we find what, that, what the mass is there. The next section, we're going to do a little more of the same. Uh, we'll get into some concepts and how to calculate the mass of, of a compound in grams, a lot of concepts there. And then we'll start to combine them into a real chemical reaction and we'll see how to balance the chemical reaction and how to predict what will form and how much of the product will form. So there's quite a few topics between here and there, but that's where we're going. So in this section, uh, we're talking about molecular mass and formula mass. So you might think molecular mass. It is very self-explanatory. It's the mass of a molecule. And that is essentially what we're going to do. So when we take this journey, I want you to recall something that we've learned in the last set of videos. Recall, recall uh, that a molecule because they are different. A molecule is something like H2O, or it's something like CO2. In other words, they're covalent bond. So we talked about this before. The molecules, when we say something is a molecule, we're typically talking about a non-metal plus another non-metal. That's what we talked about the last time. And even though hydrogen is on the left-hand side of the periodic table, it is a non-metal. So water is a non-metal plus a non-metal. Makes sense. Hydrogen is not a metal, right? It's no way. Oxygen is not a metal. So these are both combinations of non-metals, and they form what we call molecules. So they're actually, if, if you could zoom in in a bucket of water, you'd see these little molecules, which are discrete little bundles of bonded uh, atoms, and they're like floating around in their own little discrete goodness, right? That's what they are. But we also talked about uh, the uh, ionic compounds, which are, you know, there's tons of these. You use these ionic compounds every day, so they're, it's not like one is, is really like more important than the other. They're just different. Right? And the best example of that that I like to give is um, the one I use a lot, actually, is sodium chloride. Right? It's table salt because we use it every day, right? 
Now, we don't really talk about molecules of sodium chloride. You can kind of think of it that way, really, because, you know, it, you can look at the chemical formula and you can see that it's one atom of sodium for every atom of chlorine. But really, if you took a granule of table salt and zoom in on it, you're not going to see these sodium chloride atoms, like, dancing around and floating around. What you're going to see is like a regular rectangular lattice. And you're going to have a regular arrangement of the sodium followed by the chlorine, sodium, chlorine, sodium, chlorine. It's going to be this nice rigid structure. So you're not going to see this discrete molecule. You're just going to see a bunch of sodiums and a bunch of chlorines. But the ratio of sodium to chlorine in this arrangement is one to one. That's, that's what it is. That's why we use this as the representation of the chemical formula of sodium chloride because the ratio between them is one to one. So we don't call this a molecule, we call it, and if you remember we talked about this, it's a formula unit. Formula unit. All right, but I'm just telling you this mostly because these definitions serve to confuse students so much early in the, in the days of chemistry. You're thinking molecules, compounds, formula units, oh, what's the difference? Really, they're not the same. I mean, there is a difference. I'm telling you what the difference is. But from a practical point of view, when you're doing a chemical reaction, you're going to treat them all the same. The, the molecules, which are these discrete, you know, these discrete things that float around, and these, these other guys, these, these formula units and the ionic compounds, which are in a rigid lattice, when you do a chemical reaction with them, you're not going to really necessarily need to know too much uh, if one is in a lattice and one is in a molecule. Because what's, whatever is going to form is going to form. We're going to learn how to predict what's going to form. This is mostly a definition thing because on a test you might be asked, is this ionic? Is it a formula unit? Is it a molecule? Things like that. So I'm trying to help you with that. But from a practical calculation point of view, this stuff isn't really honestly that terribly important. Um, but it serves to confuse people because it's, it makes you think that life is more complicated than it really is when you, when you have so many definitions. So, let's begin to talk about the title of this section. The reason I bring this up first is because in most of your books you're going to see something called the molecular mass. Right? You're going to see the molecular mass. And uh, what that means is if you take a molecule, which is like water, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and let's look at CO2, carbon and two atoms of, atoms of oxygen. They're bonded together, right? If you look at the periodic table for carbon, you'll find that you can find the atomic mass of carbon, right, on, printed on the periodic table. And we talked in the last uh, set of videos that that's basically giving you a relative mass. The unit is atomic mass units. It's a kind of a made-up unit because we're talking about atoms, which are so small. It's not practical to give you the mass of one atom of carbon. It's incredibly tiny. So we just say we're going to have this new unit of, of mass. We're going to call it atomic mass units. And so we're going to say that when you look on your periodic table, you're going to see carbon is going to be 12 point something atomic mass units. Okay? When you look at oxygen, you're going to see on your periodic table that it's 15.999 atomic mass units. Now, to refresh your memory, you can go back and look at the previous videos. An atomic mass unit is defined, it has to have a definition of what it means. It's defined to be exactly one twelfth of a carbon 12 atom. So in the laboratory somewhere, somebody takes a carbon 12 sample, figures out exactly what one twelfth of one of these little carbon-12 atoms is, and that's going to be defined to be one atomic mass unit. Everything else on the periodic table, all those numbers, are based upon that standard. It's not that important in everyday life to care about what the standard is, but it's just telling you so you know where it comes from. All right, so what do you think is going to happen if we want to find the molecular mass? Right? It means that we, we, have, we know what the mass of carbon is in atomic mass units, and we know what the mass of oxygen is in atomic mass units. So if we want to find the molecular mass, which is the mass of the molecule, all we do is add them together. Right? So we have one atom of carbon and, one, and two atoms of oxygen, so we have to add all of those atomic masses together from the periodic table, and we're going to get what we call the molecular mass. And the unit that we get is going to be in atomic mass units, because the unit of this is atomic mass units, and so is this. <clears throat> so this is the mass in AMU, and you, when you write the unit of AMU, usually you just write U, that means AMU, of the molecule. And we'll do some examples in a minute, but really all you are doing is looking at the numbers on the periodic table and adding them all together. Since you have two atoms of oxygen, you'll have to add that one in two times because there's two atoms there. All right, now, let me switch colors here. 
uh, this is a molecular mass. Now your book is going to probably confuse you when directly under this it'll say something like uh, mass of formula unit. And there's some latitude in what and what they might say in the book, so don't get too wrapped up in how I'm writing it. it. They might say mass of a formula unit. They might say formula unit mass. They might say ionic mass for ionic compound mass or something. Basically what's happening here is they're giving you the molecular mass because these are molecules, and then we have to talk about the same concept for ionic compounds. The only, the only difference is really understanding what the difference in the compounds are, which is what we've already talked about. This is in a lattice which means there's no floating molecules around, but, and these are. But functionally, they're the same because this chemical notation represents what we care about, which is we zoom in on that lattice and we find what is the smallest ratio of sodium to chloride. That's going to be what we call a formula unit. So to find the mass of this formula unit, we do the same thing. We just find the mass of sodium from the periodic table plus the mass of chlorine. It's one to one, so we just add them together one time. Uh, so what we have, mass of a formula unit, is uh, we add up uh, AMU of, uh, in this particular example, uh, sodium and chlorine. But in general, what you're going to do is add up whatever your, your, uh, your guy is. So the bottom line is, when you find the mass of, of, a, of a molecule or the mass of an ionic compound, you're doing it exactly the same way. You're looking at the chemical formula for what you've written down, and you're finding the atomic mass from the periodic table in AMU plus the other guy in AMU. If you have subscripts, you're multiplying in there as well because you have you know, extra atoms of things, so you have to multiply a little bit as well. But that's all you're doing. You're summing them all up. The only reason I really split it out like this, I could have kind of you know, gotten through this even faster, but when you look in your book, it's quite confusing because they'll have a, usually they'll have a paragraph on here's what a molecular mass is, right? And they'll tell you what it is, and then they'll have another paragraph or something, and they'll say, here's what an ionic mass is, or a formula unit for an ionic mass is. And most students are like, oh man, there's so many things to know, I don't, th this is so confusing. It's, it's not any different. I mean, you just do exactly the same thing. The only reason they break it out is because really, um, the molecules, you know, they're structured differently than, than the formula units because they're not bound up in this lattice. So, we'll see here in just a second when we work our problems, that it's handled exactly the same way. So, let's do that. Let's do a few things. I'll just write a few guys on the board. What we want to do is we want to find the molecular mass of the following things. Let's look at um, S8. So what that, what that is, that's a molecule because we have sulfur, right? And we have eight atoms of sulfur all bonded together with one another. So they're, you know, they're joined eight atoms together. And what we want to do is find what is the molecular mass of this guy. Well, we look in the periodic table and we find that sulfur is 32.066. And that's AMU. That's atomic mass units. That's the mass of a sulfur atom in atomic mass units, right? It's kind of a relative mass, uh, basically. Hydrogen being the lightest element, you get heavier and heavier, or more massive and more massive. Sulfur is around 32 in, ter in terms of this relative number. So to find the molecular mass, you just basically know that you have eight atoms of the sulfur, so you have to take eight times the 32.066. And so what you're going to get when you do that multiplication is 256.528. What units do you have here? Well, it's atomic mass units, which is U. That's how we write atomic mass units. You can also write AMU if you want to. So 256.528. Quite simple, because you have eight atoms of sulfur, so you just multiply the guy eight times. Right? So we're just going to get a little bit, a little bit more fancy as we go, but it's the same concept. What if we have N2H4? We want to find the molecular mass of this. Notice this is a molecule because nitrogen is a nonmetal. Hydrogen is also a nonmetal. So we look on the periodic table and we see that nitrogen has an atomic mass of 14.00067 atomic mass units. And hydrogen is 1.0079 atomic mass units. So how do we do this? N2H4 equals. For nitrogen, we have two atoms. So that's 14.0067 plus 
For hydrogen, we have four atoms times this guy, 1.0079. These are all atomic mass units, so what we get in the end, 2 times the 14 is going to give you a 28.0134. This guy we multiply, we're going to get 4.0316. And so when we put it all together, N2H4, we're going to get 32.045 AMU atomic mass units. You could put a U here if you like. Right, so that's basically it. Um, you have two atoms of nitrogen, and so we multiply by two. We have four atoms of hydrogen, so we multiply by four. The units are in atomic mass units. Folks, you know, none of these problems coming up are going to be any harder than that. Well, all I'm going to do here in the next page or so is go over some slightly larger and larger chemical uh, formulas, larger and larger compounds so that we can just get a little bit of practice. But basically the concept is exactly the same. So if you get that, you're, you've got all of it. Uh, what about this guy? H3PO4. So this is hydrogen, this is phosphorus, this is oxygen. So hydrogen from the periodic table is 1.0079. Phosphorus from the periodic table is 30.9738. And oxygen from the periodic table is 15.9994. Four. And these are all in atomic mass units, right? So, here we have three atoms of, of hydrogen. So we have three times the hydrogen, 1.0079, plus the phosphorus, which is 30.9738, plus four atoms of the oxygen, which is 15.9994. So all we have to do is do this multiplication. Now, when we do this guy, this multiplication, what we're going to get is 3.0237. When we do this multiplication over here, we're going to get 63.9976. All right? So at the end of the day, H3PO4, when we add this and this and this, we're going to get 97. 0.9951 atomic mass units, right? Atomic mass units. All right, so there we go. And the next guy we're going to get into, I'm just going to kind of show you that this process does not really change no matter how complicated of a compound you have, C5H12. Well, carbon on the periodic table is 12.011 atomic mass units. Hydrogen, you're going to quickly memorize. It's 1.0079. I'm going to round it up to 8 here. Just depends on how many decimals you want to carry. You really have a little latitude there. So what you're going to have is 5 times this number, 12.011, plus 12 atoms of uh, hydrogen, 1.008. And so what you're going to have is... Uh, what you're going to have here is 60.055 for this multiplication. Here, the 12 times this is going to be 12.096. And so when you add them both together, you'll get 72.151. 72.151 atomic mass units. That's the atomic, uh, or I should say the molecular mass of this guy, C5H12. All right, so, so far it's been pretty straightforward. We've had... You know, so far, uh, two or maybe three elements that have combined into a compound, different subscripts, it's quite mechanical. You look in the periodic table, you find what the atomic mass is of the atoms that you have listed there, and then you add them up. So if you have subscripts, you have to do a little multiplication in there to get the right answer. The answer will be an atomic mass unit. So it's quite simple so far. And no matter if it's uh, ionic or covalent or whatever, you just go by the chemical formula, so you don't have to think about the fact that they're different or how they're structured. You just do exactly what the formula says. Now, here is the first time we're going to get into something slightly different, but not crazy, so don't get too worried about it. It's just I want to do a couple problems to show you how to handle this. Here's calcium, and here we have a polyatomic ion, HCO3. That's polyatomic ion. We learned about that in the um, last set of videos, and we talked about these kinds of compounds. The subscript on the outside is a 2. So this is quite a different chemical formula because we've got this polyatomic ion, but we have two of these ions, right, for every one of these calciums. So it's done the same way. It's just a little bit 
something you have to think about. But you do it the same way. So let's go to calcium on the periodic table. And what you'll find is it's 40.078 atomic mass units. Hydrogen is 1.008 atomic mass units. Carbon is 12.011 atomic mass units. And oxygen is 15.994 atomic mass units. So, so far, everything is exactly the same. So let's go ahead and write it out. The calcium is going to come from here, 40.078 plus. Now here we go. There's a couple ways to proceed. Um, I'm going to tell you the way I do it. Think about what you have here. This is a polyatomic ion. Eight, one atom of hydrogen in this ion, one atom of carbon, three atoms of oxygen. Those numbers that I just told you are what constitutes that ion. But for every, uh, every kind of uh, formula unit here, for the whole thing, we have two of these ions. So let me ask you, for every one of these formula units that we have, right, how many hydrogens are in there? Is it one or is it two? If you really want to count atoms, it's actually two atoms of hydrogen for every one of these formula units because there's two right here, right? How many atoms of carbon do you have for the whole unit? You have two atoms of carbon. Now here's the good question, how many atoms of oxygen do you have for the whole thing? You actually have six atoms of oxygen because here you have three on the inside but you've doubled it. So you're multiplying these numbers basically is what you're doing. Think back to algebra almost. When you have a number outside of parentheses you distribute it in, right? This is the same thing. Two times one is two, two times one is two, and two times three is six. So when you're adding up the masses, you can do it any way you want to, but my recommendation is to do it like this. Go like this. 2 times the hydrogen mass, 1.008, plus 2 times the carbon mass, 12.011, plus 6, 2 times 3 is 6, so I'm going to put 6 times the oxygen mass, 15.994. Now again, there's different ways to do it. Uh, you could, if you wanted to, sum up the mass of this ion and get a number and then multiply that whole thing by 2. That's fine, but you're doing the same thing by distributing the 2 in. Uh, as you go. Uh, you just have to make sure that you distribute this in, otherwise you're going to get the wrong answer. You can't ignore it, right? So, what we're going to have is 40.078 plus this 2 times this is going to give me 2.016 plus 2 times this 12 over here is 24.022 and then finally the last guy is this multiplication here which is 95 0.9964. And then when you add all these things together, for calcium, HCO3, parentheses 2, when you add all these numbers together, you will get 162.112 atomic mass units. And that's the answer. So notice that even though I kind of did some jockeying and explaining and all that stuff, really you're, you're doing exactly what we did just in the previous problem. It's just that uh, we just have to think a little bit more. We're adding up the mass of every one of these atoms we see, but we just have to recognize that when you have a polyatomic ion out, out here with a subscript, you need to multiply it in because for one unit of this whole thing, there's really two hydrogen atoms. There's two carbon atoms and there's six oxygen atoms for every whole unit of this. So we have to reflect that in our calculations. If we don't do that, we're just going to get the wrong answer. So what we're going to do now, I'm going to do two more, and they're basically going to do the same sort of thing, give you a little bit of practice with some of the bigger ones. But really, if you follow this so far, you've got the concept. We're just, and now we're in practice mode to show you very different variations to give you some practice and some confidence. Okay, for our next problem, what we're going to have, just to give you a little variation, aluminum, subscript two, SO4, subscript three, dot 18H2O. Now remember what this means. This means I have this ionic compound, right? This is a giant ionic compound, but kind of not chemically bonded, but sort of like soaked into this material. I've got 18 units of, hyd of uh, water, basically. It's called a hydrate compound. We talked about those at the end of the last DVD course, right? It, basically what it means is this, this water is not really, um, it's not really bound you know, in a molecular way to to this guy, but what it says is that basically if you take a, if you took this in a powder form and you put a certain amount of water in there, you can kind of imagine like a sponge, the water's going to be kind of soaked into it and kind of fill the gaps in there. So what this is telling us is that for every one unit of this 
formula unit right here, for every one unit of this whole thing, I've got 18 units of water kind of bound around there. So for practical purposes, even though it's not chemically bonded, right, even though it's not chemically joined with the electrons shared and all that stuff, you need to consider the whole thing when you're finding the molecular mass, right, or the, the mass of this whole thing. You have to look at every one of these atoms, including the water, because if you measure it out of the container, you're certainly going to be measuring the mass of the water that's tied up in there, too. So, you do the same thing we've done before. Aluminum is 26.9815 atomic mass units. Sulfur, 32.066 atomic mass units. Um, oxygen, 15.994 atomic mass units. And hydrogen, 1.008 atomic mass units. So those are the only atoms we have. Aluminum, sulfur, oxygen, and hydrogen. Of course, we have oxygen here, but it's the same element. So what we do is just begin our work. So we have two atoms of aluminum. So we have two Aluminum is 26.9815. Okay, so that, so far that's part easy, right? Now, we have this polyatomic ion here that we've talked about before. We have three units of it for every one unit of the whole thing. So we have to distribute the three in just like we did last time. So really we have three atoms of sulfur for every one unit of the whole thing. So three atoms of sulfur, 32.066 plus... How many atoms of oxygen do we have? Well, the, the ion has four, but we have three units of the whole thing. So four times three is 12. 12 units of oxygen here. 12 atoms of oxygen. 15.994. Uh, 15.994. Uh, so this takes care of all of this, basically, right? Now we need to continue adding in the oxygen contribution. How many atoms of oxygen, do, of, uh, sorry, of hydrogen do we have for the whole thing? Well, we have 18 times 2, which is 36. 36 atoms of hydrogen, which is 1.008. Plus, how many atoms of oxygen do we have? We have 18 times 1, so we have 18. Atoms of oxygen, 15.994. So we're basically done at this point. We just need to do the math. All right, so what we'll have for this is 53.9630 plus this guy is going to be 96.18 plus this guy is going to be 191.9928 plus this multiplication is going to be 36.288 plus this guy, that's a big number, it's going to be 287.9892. So when we add all of these guys together, what we will have for um, Al2SO4 3.18H2O, so 18 water molecules for every one of these units. When we add all of this stuff together, we'll get 666.413 atomic mass units. So you see the concept is exactly the same. It's just a much bigger deal. So I'm trying to give you some various examples so that you can say, okay, I have two atoms of aluminum, okay, I have three atoms of sulfur, I have 12 atoms of oxygen, I have 36 atoms of hydrogen, and here I have one atom of, or I should say the 18 atoms of oxygen. That's why we have the 18 out there. So you basically treat them as coefficients almost like an algebra, right? And uh, you're going to get the right number there. Now occasionally on a test or on an exam, they won't give you the chemical formula, they'll just give you the name of the compound. And it's just to try to exercise your, your muscles from before. So if we say, what about dinitrogen tetroxide? Right? So the first step is to find out what the chemical formula is for this. And if you remember, uh, we have di, the prefix is two, so two nitrogens. Tetra, if you remember, tetra is four oxide, so we have O4. So we're dealing with N2O4, so they, we could have just started with this, but on, sometimes on a test they'll, they'll make you translate it just to show that you know what that means as well. So what we're going to have, uh, when you look in your periodic table, two atoms of nitrogen, and the mass of nitrogen is 14.0067 atomic mass units, you can look that up, plus four atoms of oxygen, but each oxygen atom is 15.9994, right? So we just do this multiplication and we'll get 
0.0134. We do this multiplication, we'll get 63.9976. And so when we add these two guys together, we'll for N2O4, we will get 92.011 atomic mass units. 92.011 atomic mass units for the whole thing. The only thing we had to do here is take the words and translate it into the, into the formula and then we could do the rest of the work. So expect that because a lot of times teachers like to combine two problems into one just to see if you know what you're doing. So that pretty much does it for this section. We've got a great start in these next batch of videos. And so I really want to make sure you truly understand what we're doing here because everything we're doing here is so important when we get later on into uh, into chemical reactions and, and predicting what's going to happen. We're going to be calculating the mass all the time of these things. So it's incredibly important. And that's why I wanted to do several examples with these polyatomic ions here to show you how to handle it so you're really comfortable with it. It does not matter how long or complicated. The teacher can give you an, a chemical formula a mile long, but as long as you add up every one of those atoms and their atomic mass contribution to the whole thing, you're going to get the right answer. I'm, I'm Jason with MathTutorDVD.com. I hope you've learned something here. Watch it a couple times if you need to. When you're comfortable with this, go on to the next section, which is, again, additional crucial material uh, in the study of chemistry.